our theme song here. Uh, um, very nice NFT. Very thankful for NFTs actually, because you're allowed to to uh, have your own music your own YouTube video. But yeah, welcome to another episode of the Two P and O Pro. This is a special Beat the Makers episode, starting myself, Frank Cruz, and. Hi, this is Tim, also known as Tim, as a Make a Delegate Club. You might want to repeat your name there, Tim, because uh, the music was pretty loud. Yeah, I get your drift now. Yeah, it's, it's really loud. Uh, we really need a content <laughs> production call unit again, or at least somebody who's helping us on the quality. Yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, this is a special episode of The Music Was Too Loud for anyone that didn't hear the intro of Meet the Delegates. We pretty much just you know, go live uh, on Zoom, but um, we don't edit this video. So this is pretty raw, as raw as going to get. Uh, and, and in today's first ever Meet the Makers episode, we have a special guest. Uh, I would say right now, in my opinion, by far the uh, number one facilitator, and that's my opinion, but the number one facilitator maker DAO as a DAO, as a core, you know, component of, of what it is. Um, and uh, yeah, by no further ado, Derek Flossman, welcome to our episode of the Shoot and o Pro Maker DAO Meet the Makers Happy Hour. Thank you, guys. Appreciate being here. It's good to see you both. It's been a while. I think the last time we caught up was, uh, was Paris, wasn't it? So yeah, good to see you again. Yeah, it was Paris just after after your retreat. That's right. Yes, we had an L2 retreat. So we were deep diving into everything L2, multi-chain, teleport related. So yeah, we can we can dive into all of that if you want. Terrific. But before we do that, there's a ritual that we do here. That's obviously a uh, happy hour where we do a tasting of one of uh, of the our favorite uh, um it could be any kind of uh, beverage, right? It could be coffee, which we haven't had a guest yet to do that. Or it could be, you know, a non-alcoholic beer, which I've heard some of them are pretty good. Uh, but today we're going to kick it off with uh, a special martini that I bought here at this place uh, in uh, in uh, Braswa, uh, which is Poland. Uh, this is called the Porn Star Martini. Don't ask me why, um, but... Apparently, it's made out of uh, vanilla infused. Uh, Ostoya vodka uh, has uh, passion fruit puree. You can see it there, and uh, lime juice, vanilla syrup, and uh, some sparkling wine. And it comes with this shot. Well, I got a bug flying around here. It comes with the shot that actually uh, I get to pour in. So I'm gonna pour this in while I'm doing that. Uh, Shupi, tell us what you're drinking today. Uh, oh, wow, again, I'm, I'm, well, that's that's really looking awesome. Um, I would like to have this as well because what I what I bring here or what I'm going to drink today is a beer from Sardinia. That's uh, one of the the islands in the Mediterranean Sea um, belonging to Italy. Uh, it's called Ichnusa or something like this. Um, and the, the the biggest thing about this, from my point of view, is uh, or two things actually. I, I the last time I was drinking this was uh, last uh, summer when I was on Sardinia, and usually drinks when you're somewhere abroad are really nice, and when you bring them home, they are not as good anymore. Um, so this is going to be some experiment for me. And the second thing is, this is a really large bottle, even compared to to German standard. So it has two-thirds of a liter within one bottle. So it's twice the kit size. I Very cool. It. Twice the kit size. Impressive, yes. man. <laughs> Adult size beer. <laughs> Derek, what do you have for us? So me, I, I've gone uh, original OG here. This is uh, Budweiser, Budvar. But of course, it's not the American one that most people may be familiar with. This is the original Czech lager. And as it says, owned by the Czech Republic. Uh, it's a full strength beer and it's, uh, but let's, uh, let's give it a go. But uh, I'm expecting it to taste something similar to like a Sarah Pramen, uh, like a, a summer lager, you know, the, the weather is fitting in Europe at the moment to, to uh, drink such a beer. So uh, yeah, cheers everyone. Cheers mate. I'm not going to put up my martini too high because it's about to spill over, but. Cheers, Derek. Cheers. So yeah, it's it's nice. It's quite light. It's um, exactly what you'd expect from a summer lager. You know, nice and sort of crispy, light. Would go well with the steak. So yeah, maybe maybe that'll be on the menu later on today. 
will go well with a steak, huh? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's that's fine with a martini as well. I would go with a steak as well, right? <laughs> uh, normally I do a red wine, but you know, yeah, I guess I never had that, but yeah, I guess a puree with um, with a steak. That's interesting. But okay, Derek, what what are you going to give this? We normally rate them from one to five. Obviously, five stars being top notch. I mean, this is the kind of like rating review that if you give it a five stars, then every single maker community member should go out there and buy this beer. Is this a five, Derek? Mm, it's pretty good. Like it's it. Although it's a it's a personal thing, though. See, I don't quite like super hoppy beers, and this one's quite mellow, quite you know relaxed uh and it's it's sort of a chill out kind of beer so i would give it a uh from myself a probably a four star all right very nice four stars for a budweiser never thought i'd hear the day that a budweiser gets four star review but original budweiser it's the original OG. Yeah. <laughs> the og spoken like a true og how about you tim yeah i have to admit i i was i was um um, expecting that it's not as good as it was last year while I was on vacation, but it's actually pretty good. The only downside is that I took it from the fridge about an hour ago, so it's not as cold as it should be. Um, it's it's also pretty mellow. It's uh, not as strong as I usually drink beer, so it's it's actually fitting to uh, yeah being here outside by with 30 degrees still summertime. Um, I'd say I give it a 3.4. Ooh, 3.4. Yeah, that's, that's about a, eh, it could be good, it could be bad, depending on the mood or the day uh, or the food you're eating yeah. with. But look, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. This thing here, all I'm tasting is puree and vodka. So this is not, this is not my typical uh, martini. At least I could be wrong, but though I'm not a martini expert, but uh, I'm going to give this a 2.5 and... Uh, yeah, I'll link the, uh, the restaurant here. I think they have better drinks. It's just like probably picked uh, a silly, a silly uh, cocktail with a silly name, like Corn Star Martini. That's, so that's my fault. But the other one was an Aperol Spritz, which I already reviewed on uh, one, of the, one of the previous episodes. So, yeah, I took a risk. So 2.5 stars for me. Shoot me. Make sure you are uh, taking notes down because uh, I think you might have to do this review. But all right, let's get let's get moving and let's get on to the fun stuff. Derek, uh, thank you for having you know you as a guest here. You're the first ever, as I mentioned, Eric core unit member to come on uh, the Shoopy and Pro uh, Maker DAO Delegate Happy Hour. So, um, can you give us a little bit of a background of where were you before joining Maker DAO? Necessarily, you don't have to get into you know uh, the crypto ecosystem, but maybe uh, what's your background and just being able to put together everything. Uh, for the protocol engineering team. I think you do a superb job and just kind of want to get an idea. So the folks who don't know you from the maker community or the ecosystem might get to know you a little bit more. Uh, yeah, Steve, you can just give us a little bit of a background refresher where you started and how you got here. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, for me, it all started in uh, traditional finance, actually. I started in uh, capital markets and structured products in London. Uh, at a bank called Saxo Bank. You may know them. Uh, they do a lot of uh, you know, online software, um, similar to E-Trade, eToro, that sort of a software platform. So originally I started in that space, uh, working directly with clients as a FSA regulated individual, uh, offering insight into markets. And then I found my uh, you know, interest was much more towards the software side. So building software, building trading systems, uh, working with teams that were building algorithmic black box trading systems. And that sort of moved me into this software space, which you know, crypto is very much a part of. And uh, from there, it was that was actually at the time of the financial crisis. Uh, so everything came tumbling down. You know, I remember being outside the building of Lehman Brothers. Uh, I was working you know, side by side with some of those guys uh, and girls at the time. And, you know, they were walking out the door with boxes. So you're like, uh sort of see another side of finance and, and what it was at like at the time. Uh, so I, I set off from that point to, um, I, I decided to create my own brokerage white labeling the software uh, that we had uh, helped build at the time. And uh, 
the financial crisis at the time made it really difficult to work with banks as intermediaries because they're just like, you know, liquidity is such an important thing. And when you don't have that in order to be able to offer structured products and long tail options, then it's uh, really difficult to pursue. So I um, then kind of pivoted into the software space a little bit more and did uh, risk compliance, uh, governance risk and compliance software that uh, banks I think I think you might have uh, you might have gotten um, uh, muted there. Your headphones might have let you down. Is that right, Tim? Am I am I seeing the same thing? No, it's uh, I was I was thinking it's my side again. But if you yeah. experienced the same thing, yeah, I think we we lost Derek for a brief moment. We we lost Derek for a brief moment. The uh, uh, showcase superstar. Uh, but once you get your microphone back up, I think I have a question for you. Um, how in the world did we get to retain you as opposed to FTX or someone like that or jump trading? Because you seem to have all that background and the pedigree to be working for FTX, Alameda or jump. Maybe uh, no luck with the audio there. And he's gone. I mean, he's still here, but. I yeah, can't we can see him. you. We can see you. We just can't uh, hear you. Um, but yeah, Tim, while well, he's working on that, I mean, that, those, those are some, um, it's a pretty, pretty impressive background. I mean, working for, you know, trade finance and doing a lot of that stuff. Uh, I think I heard you drop the microphone yeah. there. Uh, there. He's back. Yeah, you guys hear me? Yeah, we yeah. should hear you. Yeah. Okay, cool. Hopefully there's not too much feedback, but um, uh, yeah, so how, how did you guys get me? I guess, uh, you know, moving from the software space into um, into crypto, I was a part of the community originally. I really liked what Maker was doing. It's this intersection between crypto, crypto traditional values, decentralization, uh, censorship resistance, uh, and the conversation wasn't, you know, all the way far in the direction of cypherpunks. It was a mix of that, but it, it was also, uh, and still is, a mix of uh, traditional finance, economic concepts, the financial world. So bringing those two together was something, you know, I was across a whole bunch of different ecosystems as a participant and all my weekends were spent in this time and, you know, across these different ecosystems. And Maker was really the only one where it brought these two elements together. And so when the opportunity came up, I was like, okay, let's, let's do it. Let's jump in because uh, there's just so much, uh, so much going on in this space. And at the time, this was before uh, we'd launched MCD. So we were you know, still talking around different com concepts. You know, should we have the TRFM? Uh, you know, even you know, a lot of these similar concepts that are being talked about today with regards to dollar paying and, and so on. So um, yeah, very, very interesting sort of journey you know, once I got on board to Maker and have really enjoyed it ever since. So this is something I think the community aspect is not something you see elsewhere. And that also filters into how you, I think, run a team and work with individuals in a team because we're not a company, right? We're a DAO, so everyone has voices. You have to support uh, different voices, different uh, angles and, and viewpoints from people within the DAO. So it's a, it's a different sort of way of, I guess, interacting uh, in some ways, managing or trying to steer when you know, there's these different viewpoints. So, uh, so yeah, hopefully that gives some context and color to, to the history. Man, man, those are some impressive, uh, that's an impressive resume. And uh, thank you for sharing that background there. Um, you know, as I was telling Shupi before, I'm pretty, pretty happy that uh, you chose not to go work at Jump Trading or uh, stayed in uh, TradFi. But I think uh, from getting to know you and meeting you at uh, conferences in person, I can tell you're the kind of uh, individual who is looking to innovate, is looking to grow and expand um, yourself, you know, into different realms. So, I'm happy that we have you here, that you were part of multi-collateral die, and now you're helping the protocol get into the layer two uh, ecosystem. But let's move on. I mean, how, how is it working? You know, speaking of move, transitioning from that background to working at PECU protocol engineering core unit, how's life there? What's going on there? One thing I admire about your team, by the way, before you get into it, is that a lot of the individuals who are part of that team a lot of the maker community might not hear from them every single day, but they're working, they're working behind the scene. And when I was in, um, I believe it was Lisbon, uh, could have been ECC 
uh, sorry, Eve Lisbon, one of those. I met a lot of the individuals that are not vocal, but they are super impressive. They have tremendous amount of talent. And I think the maker community forgets that at times. So if you can kind of expand how his life is going at Paku, that'd be so awesome. Yeah, definitely. And uh, yeah, I mean, the guys on the team, they're absolute rock stars. Like the, the level of effort they put in uh, is yeah, it's not something I've seen before anywhere else. And, you know, people say, oh, yeah, come to crypto. It's, it's, it's cool and kind of easy. But it's like, oh, wait, hang on. It's yeah, you got the Twitter overhead. You've got all sorts of, uh, you know, throughout the day from morning to evening. It's a nonstop industry. Um, and our so our week, what does it typically look like? I guess like breaking it down, you know, we have a planning session on Monday. We have protocol community calls on Tuesday and Thursday. We have coding and code review calls typically on like the Wednesday and the Friday. Uh, and that's really important because it, it helps us, uh, you know, prevent as much context switching uh, as possible so that we focus, we deep dive where, where we're able to. Um, and then, yeah, of course, on top of that, we have the, the ongoing weekly spell cadence. So we, we typically always have one writer and two reviewers. And here we're working a lot with uh, CES. Uh, so on top of that, you know, as the standard sort of daily calendar or the weekly calendar goes, we then, of course, have the, the crypto Twitter drama on top of that. We also have you know, protocol developments like this end game discussion. Then there's ecosystem developments that we've got to keep on top of. So, yeah, a lot of that is things like Compound V3. So, yeah, we've been working on the V2 version, but we've also got to keep in mind where is the industry going and how are we thinking up to that in the future as well. Um, so that's that, like, you know, keeps us pretty busy. Um, in terms of the team and what it's like working on the team, you know, aside from myself leading the backlog prioritization, we we kind of, I mean, we hold each other accountable. So we're a very flat team. Uh, we work very closely together. We do peer reviews, code reviews together. Uh, we have uh, post-mortems together internally. Some of those make the, their way to the forum. So we do maintain this. Uh, we are all responsible together. Um, and I think that's an important part of having a flat team. So everyone realizes you know, what others are doing and, and how it all contributes to the, to the goal. Um, and you know that all helps us align, I guess, through me to the community with regards to priorities. So you guys will see the um, the, the monthly summaries that I do, where we show you know what we've walked through. And um, so yeah, there's a lot of work going on. I guess another layer on top of all of that is a bit of the stress at the moment with regards to you know, tornado cash sanctions. Um, not new to any of us here, but uh, so that that's a big topic we can get into if we want. And then. Yeah, from a priorities perspective, like what the team is working on now and what it's like working on those, we have quite a few in parallel. So, you know, you mentioned before the L2 work. So teleport, multi-chain, that's a big one. Uh, I mentioned the Aave Compound D3M currently in review. So we're going to see that soon. Uh, we've also got a lot of cross-team work going on. So, you know, working with Deco, fixed rates, that's going to come soon as well. Uh, we work with CES. So uh, working with them on like spell review for the real world asset work, uh, likewise Starknet. So we're going to do a side-by-side -side review with them in September and that's gonna come out soon as well. So that's pretty cool. Um, we also wanna revisit um, with growth, like institutional vaults, that's another one. Like let's see where that landscape lies. So work with them on that. And then there's a bunch of technical work that kind of happens in the background. So we've got, uh, things like um, emergency shutdown simulation. So making sure the system works in certain particular scenarios that may occur. Uh, also, what about automation? We've been talking about automation a lot with regards to tornado cache and you know, we need to harden the protocol. What does that mean? Is it rates? Is it other elements? How can we eliminate some governance overhead and automate things? So they sound uh, you know, fairly high level, but all of these have very deep uh, level impacts across the protocol. So uh, a lot of stuff happening there and uh, also, you know, keeping an eye, like I said, on the, the things that may be coming. What about NFTs? We've spoken about it. Are, are Oracle's in a place to support NFTs as collateral in the protocol? Um, I personally don't think so, but we need to do that research to determine, okay, what could it look like if we were to get there? And the same across other other uh, modules like Vox, TRFM, these things, you know, how do they all fit? So. Yeah, to sum it up, I'd say there's there's a lot of parallel things going on. There's a lot of breadth. 
so uh, sometimes it's difficult to keep uh, a pace with. But uh, yeah, we have such amazing guys on the team. Um, really, really, you know, cream of the crop in terms of the industry. So very happy to be working alongside them on all of this. What what I would like to to deep deep dive a bit into. I mean, last week we had Greg from RWA Co with us, and we learned a lot about how the interaction with the DAO feels from the outside. Um, I mean, we um, I spent quite some time, and I guess this is true for most of the of the community. Uh, we we spend a lot of time um, basically with a lot of stuff that I guess a team like protocol engineering would see as distraction. Like I mean, the the whole real world finance drama. Um, all those things going on about the end game, which might or not, might not be something that is some kind of viable future. Uh, then we have stuff like uh, the the sudden discussion about depegging from the USD, or at least going to some some stuff like a floating currency. Uh, what what I what I would really uh, would like to learn is in a compared to a, to a, um, to a company um, where we basically have a top down mission that is basically exercise through the whole organization um, how how can the members of protocol engineering um, or to, to what kind of level could the the, the protocol engineering team uh, stick to exactly what what you would give them as priority versus how much of the distraction is actually disturbing them and basically yeah yeah unfoc or defocusing mm -hmm. them from from the stuff that they actually would like to do I mean, the, the whole make yeah. council of maker thing, for example, was also something that that was quite broad, also from from contributors within or from people on the payroll. Um, so, how much of a how much of a mess is it? Uh, what we don't see from the outside. Yeah, I guess we we see the same as you guys actually when it comes to these developments, whether it's coming from Hatsu and the, the council of makers, or if it's from Rune and the end game. Uh, we we pay attention, I guess, where it comes to talking about the notion of ossifying the core protocol and, and splitting out some of these revenue generating activities into metadata as an example. Um, I we, we have had conversations with Rune as a team and said, okay, what are you looking to do? But a lot of these concepts are still in flux. They're still moving. So they don't change what we have to deliver now and what we've committed as part of our mandate. So we stick to those, you know, the priorities I just kind of quickly ran through. They, they are kind of the critical things. And as part of that weekly focus, it's, you know, these are the items we're focusing on this week. And, you know, is there any other discussion to bring up? Um, sometimes there'll be calls with Rune and that'll be, okay, we'll take a couple of hours to discuss it, to walk through some of these uh, MetaDAO tokenomics. Um, but before those are solidified, really, these are just discussions that we're not really deep diving into from a technical implementation point of view because they're still kind of fluid they're they're not you know well formed enough to the point where we can say okay here's an architectural diagram uh, and you guys will see and this is another interesting point where you know this is not a company this is a DAO. so everyone's free, free to voice their opinions and thoughts and you'll see a lot of that in the forum in the discord and uh, i think that's fine uh, i'm i'm not trying to Uh, or I don't have any issues with that. And I think it's very positive for these feelings and thoughts to be made public because that helps the public discussion and discourse move in the right direction as a collective. Um, so yes, it can be a little bit uh, distractive sometimes when you have groups of core units doing things that maybe we don't really align to, but then it's our prerogative and, and we have to voice the concerns that we have. And uh, I, I think we do that you know, on the GNR call uh, sufficiently. Um, and otherwise we focus on the, the tasks we have. Would you would you say that the amount of buy-in that is generated uh, among your, your people is sufficient? Or would you say that uh, you're basically lacking to get involved? I mean, I, when, I, when I hear stuff like you have calls with Rune, I would say, oh, that's, that's actually nice because that, that makes sure that Uh, the, one of the core groups of the contributors at the protocol level are actually involved and not that they are getting handed down decisions, but they are actually part of it. Would you, would you say that the level of involvement to, to, yeah, to, to get the people engaged and yeah, generating buy-in is sufficient or is it, should, it, yeah. should that be better? 
Um, at this stage, I think it's sufficient. Um, we've, we've all, everyone on the team, uh, so occasionally I will set up a call for the whole team to do a walkthrough of, okay, let's all read the latest uh, set of documents, you know, long for wisdom summary, and then go through the documents. Okay, what do we, what do we think, where do we think this lies? What questions do we have? And we have had a feedback loops with Rune where, you know, we've questioned him and pushed him on certain points and, and had that conversation. It's still fairly early to be diving into any real implementation. The limit of what we can do is say, okay, well, uh, have you looked at the amount of MKR that you're intending to use for certain MetaDAO token purchases or users collateral? So that, that sort of you know, fundamental questions are still sort of hanging out there. So we're still trying to understand what that means. And um, so for now, because it feels so early, we, we do have those conversations. We don't have any set specific uh, implementation, but the discussion is happening and we are involved. Um, it's difficult to have a, um, a full buy-in versus not because it's still evolving. So we're still, you know, is it how many metadata is it going to be? Is there going to be a council of makers? Maybe they're similar sort of things. Maybe the delegates have a different role. Uh, how does that impact the technical side of an implementation? Still kind of unknown. Uh, but in general, you know, we, we do have the conversations and are following along. Uh, I think myself more so than the rest of the team, purely because you said from a distraction point of view, we have work that we need to do. We've got stuff we need to carry on with. So, um, you know, I take the DVC calls and try to summarize back to the team with, with what's going on. Uh, and at the moment, until it steps into the realm of okay, technical, uh, perhaps economic specific discussion, then yeah, we're kind of, I think we're in a good place. I think that's so awesome, uh, by the way. And, uh, I wanted kind of like to point out how I'm impressed by the fact that, you know, Peku and hopefully other core units are doing the same thing or out there uh, having a discussion maybe with a, a proposal author um, who's written something up and maybe they don't agree with it. Uh, maybe they might agree with it. Maybe they, you know, a quarter agree with it. But I think it's amazing that you guys are out there at least listening, right? Like carrying out the proposal author. Um, because I think there are some core units out there that, you know, that are possibly uh, kind of shutting down their ears to any kind of proposal they immediately might disagree with. And um, that's something that I always admire about protocol engineering. And why do you think that this is the case? Is it because of your leadership? Is this something that you ask every single team member to at least have an open ear, open mind to? Or is it just, just the nature of the team and they're, they're just built that way? I think a big part of it is the nature of the team that, you know, we're all individuals. We all have a voice. Um, we're all free to speak it and say what we feel, uh, as you've seen from, you know, many, you know, PE members on, on the GNR call, that there's, there's no shyness to step up and say what we feel, uh, which I think is a great thing. And, uh, you know, if you didn't have that, I think you'd be missing a lot of uh, opportunity and insight from people who have been in the space from the early days. And, uh, it's a lot of those core values which we need to listen to and take into account. Uh, and I think that that offers a lot of value and in, insight. Got it. Uh, and on the subject of protocol engineering, uh, we recently had a proposal. So on the subject of both PE and uh, proposals being put on the forum, uh, we had two of your uh, team members, which in my opinion are true OGs of just the entire ecosystem, right? Um, you had you had them put up a proposal asking to be offboarded as mandated actors. Can you just kind of explain what that means to the audience who might not know, and also yeah, sure. uh, kind of how your team is dealing with that? Yeah, definitely. So let me, I guess, let me first give some background as to, um, yeah, like set the scene, I guess. So. Uh, in this case, yes, they were requesting to be offboarded as mandated actors, and the, the mandated actors predate the role of facilitators because it was introduced, I think, round about the towards the end of where the foundation was scaling down, and the the purpose of that was to vote in mandated actors as domain experts, and uh, it had a couple of um, reasons for doing so. One was, I think, to distance the foundation from decisions that the community was making and also uh, to enable the community to be a bit more directly involved in, in, in either building or adding value and discussion to uh, 
topics that were being discussed and that's since merged into the mandated actors meeting um so now that the scene sort of changed a little bit you know we've we don't have the foundation anymore uh, we have core units and in this case uh chris and brian uh you know didn't feel the need to retain the mandated actor uh label um so practically it doesn't mean too many it doesn't actually mean any any changes uh, they still remain contributors and members to the protocol engineering team as they did before so no changes there which is great um they no longer attend the mandated actors call uh which yeah come to think of it we should really change this to be like facilitator alignment call or something of that nature because it's it's a room where we have the the facilitators once a week you know uh have a, a session where we make sure we're all aligned you know are we developing things that Oracle has the right lead time to its risk in the loop with new collateral being onboarded. So we need a forum where all of this is kind of covered. And, you know, I represent some of that from the PET team and feedback to the team. So they didn't feel there was a need for that. Um, so I still maintain, you know, obviously my close working relationship with these guys uh, as part of the team. So nothing has changed other than perhaps, you know, they get an hour back every week. Uh, which is good. So it, it's again kind of helps focus on the efficiency and the focus of the team mandate to kind of you know, again keep us focused on on what we're building. So it's not at all a sign for starting to detach from the DAO or the group or whatever, because that would be something that I would be pretty scared about if those two guys are are moving on to something different. That's not the well, case. No, but I mean, I guess you can infer some of the concern around the tornado cash uh, events of recent. So I think that's a that's a, an understandable concern across the industry. Uh, we've seen other core units change certain handles in Discord, and uh, I imagine there'll be some changes as to how uh, individuals work with code and deploy code and that sort of thing. So I think there'll be there'll be some changes in that space to come, um, which is understandable given the nature of you know, what happened two weeks ago. Is this actually something that you are afraid of for you personally as well, the whole tornado, tornado cash thing? Because I mean, probably being the facilitator of the main group of writing spells and owning the protocol is, I don't know, probably even, even more risky than being, I don't know, a delegate, for example. Is it something that you are concerned about? Uh, there, there is an element of uh, caution, definitely. Like, what, what does this mean from a legal perspective, from a technical perspective? How, how do we manage it as individuals, not only delegates and facilitators, but core contributors as well? So core contributors, you know, in this case, not being mandated actors, where a facilitator is technically someone brought in by the community, by MKR token holders. So there is a responsibility to act on their behalf. So uh, yeah, definitely, it's, this is still a very new nascent space. And what does it mean for us as individuals is still being figured out, you know, LLTs don't protect you from what could be inferred as criminal activity. So how does that uh, factor into our operations as people, you know, doing work for the DAO? Um, not only facilitators, but everyone really. So yeah, I don't, I don't have a good answer for you there. It's definitely, um, uh, something you know, I was going to say on the radar, but it's a little bit closer than on the radar. It's, it's something we're actively trying to figure out and work with others in the DAO to you know, have a good approach and something that's, uh, that's meaningful and safe. Yeah, and for those who don't, uh, I guess who have been hiding under a rock or been busy vacationing through August all over Europe or South America or what have you, that don't know what's going on, OFAC, which is the, uh, I guess you can call it the watchdog of the Treasury Department of the United States, has sanctioned Tornado Cash for allegedly um, allowing a North Korean group by the name of Lazarus, uh, who allegedly uh, took a bunch of uh, crypto platforms for uh, tokens and then used uh, the mixer known as Tornado Cash and Obviously, there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, worry developers out there. So, Derek, I kind of wanted to get your idea. You know, not only do you have a team of developers, but I'm pretty sure you have a connections with other individuals who are part of the ecosystem. When I mean connections, I mean friendships, right? I mean, I even have friendships with folks that could run circles around me when it comes to uh, developing software. So, uh, what what are you hearing out there? What, if you have your ear to the ground, what are you hearing as far as developers and the fear? of them, uh, you know, just writing codes uh, 
as an American, that's just the freedom that I believe I should be allowed to have. So uh, what are you hearing out there, man? Yeah, I mean, I guess the, yeah, the last couple of days has really seen uh, some strong discussion on both sides of the fence. On one side, you've got institutions arguing, arguing that, yes, of course, we should be working with regulators. And on the other hand, you have the cypherpunks saying, no, of course not, because we know where this ends. We've seen it in the past. Look at the courts, uh, the issues that, that are there. So uh, it's a very hot topic. Um, I, I don't know if I have a, an answer, but your, your summary there of, you know, you know, I think the sanctions aggressively overstepping uh, or you know, overstepping the power of OFAC, uh, I, I think is, is valid. And we saw a member, I'm not sure if it was a member of Congress, uh, submit a, a uh, Tom a, Emmers. Tom Emmers of Minnesota wrote to uh, uh, Treasury Department in the last 24 hours. So I'm super excited about that. I'm yeah, stoked, I, actually. Yeah, I think he made some really, really good points. Uh, from memory, there was, yeah, that, yeah, I think there was uh, that this is this is a different development because it's being levied uh, against you know arguably neutral uh, open source code. These contracts, uh, I think he wrote, technological uh, tools that are self-sufficient and you know again open source code. So this is a real sort of precedent shift. Uh, a, a new precedent is being set by going down this path, uh, and I think much of it is still. To be to be seen, um, you know, Frank. You mentioned earlier we were we were at consensus earlier this year at uh, Austin, uh, which was great. But one of the one of the worries I had there was that people are not taking decentralization and censorship resistance seriously. There was one talk from Snowden who who touched on pretty much this point specifically. But other than that, uh, you know, meeting with a whole bunch of other protocols. Everyone was kind of like, oh, validator risk, not really concerned about it, should be fine. And maybe that doesn't matter for NFT platforms, but for core foundational DeFi, it absolutely does matter. And that awareness and concern, uh, you know, isn't there from a lot of the people I spoke to at that event. Uh, I don't know if it's specific, specific to, to that event. Um, perhaps, you know, Bogota will have a different crowd and a different understanding. Um, but I think what we need to do is, you know, really get behind... Uh, entities like Coin Center make sure that uh, you know we we fight uh, from you know r rally behind them to to pursue this, uh, but also we can't shy away from uh, building censorship resistant code from the first place. You know if we don't do that, we're going to walk down this path anyway. So, uh, and you're seeing similar things with um, you know, flashbots. Um, what's the other one? There's uh, blocks blocks root. I think it is, you know, offering, yeah, yeah like there's a, a bunch of different options here that can be em employed. Um, there's still trade-offs though. So it's, it's really at a foundational level we have to have to do this. Yeah, I think uh, BlocksRoute is actually offering three different types of scenarios where, uh, hmm. this is E2.0, by the way, when there's uh, proof of stake and there's validators uh, validating each block, right? So um, they're offering the ability for three scenarios where two of them, uh, they can validate any block, right? No censorship resistant. And the third block can actually uh, censor any, as an example, as a tornado cash OFAC sanction Ethereum address. Um, there was, so there was a meeting that I, I actually need to watch the replay. It was, uh, I believe, the uh, Ethereum developers call. You ever attend, attend those and uh, if you did this week's, because I had a lot of fireworks, um, what were your thoughts on that? I know a lot of the topic was around flashbots and that uh, new code on GitHub that they, I think they're either releasing soon or released it already, where you will be able to sanction anything related to uh, OFAC sanctioning or any future sanctioning in this crazy world that uh, other government regulators might take up. Uh, so yeah, you, if you can touch on that real quick. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't attend the call, but I did catch up on some brief uh, Twitter comments on that. And I think it was, yeah, uh, you mentioned Flashbots um, and, of course, Ethermine. And, I mean, we also saw earlier in the week there was Infura Alchemy. Uh, yeah, we're all complying with OFAC sanctions and stopped including, in this case, Tornado Cash transactions last week. Um, but the interesting thing that you mentioned with Flashbots is that they're accelerating that open, co open source code. So... I think it's uh, what is it's a Mev Mev product of some sort that they're pushing forward, and yeah, that'll give them the ability to, uh, you know, not saying it'll give 
I guess the way to summarize it is that it separates builders who are the creators of transactions from the proposers who are the ones that propagate those blocks you know, to the wider network. So by doing so, validators will be able to choose uh, you know, which relay they want to use and in doing so either censor or not censor. Um, this, is, this is good, but it's also a little concerning because it makes developers the enforcers of you know, what is censorship, what should be censor censored. So if, I'm, I haven't quite wrapped my head around it, but I feel like there could be some exposure to individual risk. So again, like we need to build from the ground up. We need to prevent individual, or we need to not leave it to individuals to censor because people are then exposed and then it goes down a very slippery slope. So uh, yeah, I'm not sure how that's gonna pan out, but I'm very happy that they are uh, releasing the code that will be open source that means if we can get a substantial amount of people to use it, then it means that the the other you know uh, relay would not be used. So um, I'm optimistic there, but uh, again, ground up censorship resistance is necessary. You know, it is, it's super interesting that you bring up MEV, which is minor extractable value. Uh, I think going back about maybe six months, maybe 12 months, I remember listening to a podcast and I believe it was a developer. I can't remember their names, but they were working on Ethereum and they eventually left uh, Flashbots because they felt like Flashbots is actually helping <laughs> improve the ability for folks to extract value, right? MEV, uh, if I got that correct. But, you know, as far as your thoughts with MEV, and I know I, I've asked Kurt Barry, one of your team members about this, and it almost seems like MEV will always be existent. And I guess, you know, when you think about traditional finance, it was MEV back in the days when I first traded my first piece of stock. I'm pretty sure I was being front run. I'm pretty sure like, you know, the bid and the ask was so wide that there were like 10 people in between me and I was getting the worst price ever, right? So yeah, you, you weren't even in the same order book, Frank. <laughs> I, I, wasn't, I wasn't even in the same zone. You're right about that. So do you think MEV would stay here forever in your personal opinion? Or you think that's something that, Oh, oh, let's put it this way, flashbots, right? And we have a delegate, Hasu, who actually works um, for the uh, protocol. And uh, what are your thoughts on flashbots? Is it helping? Is it um, somehow keeping MEV going and just extracting value from retail folks like myself and Tim Shupi or what? Uh, and possibly also myself, I don't know. Um, yeah, good question. I, I don't, I'm not sure. I think they need, the ecosystem needs to be incentive driven. Otherwise you get actors that don't, uh, you know, that bend the rules or don't play by the rules. Um, on the technical side, I really haven't looked into it enough to be able to know, um, you know, what the alternatives would be, uh, especially in the ETH2 world. So one of the things we're going to do, a uh, little bit of a tangent here, but coming up to ETH2, we're probably going to have a community uh, call or, you know, have people on, on the call as the merge happens so that we can track everything you know, internally, all our oracles, all the PE work, make sure that everything is up and running as it needs to be. But from the, the MEV perspective, not sure, it's not really my area of expertise, but uh, I'm sure you know, Hasu, Kurt, these guys will absolutely be able to deep dive for you on that one. Very cool, very cool. Tim, you, you anything uh, that comes to mind as far as MEV or layer twos? Yeah. I know I just just to can emphasize this. It's all about incentives. So if there are incentives, then or if the incentives are not not uh, laid out right, then you're going to get from. Um, so I, I think this is not something. That really um, so I don't know if you if you want to sell a large portion of whatever, or if you want to buy a large portion of OKR, you you will almost immediately get front run. I got front run just with the tiny amounts that I'm buying or selling. Um, and, and the only way to mitigate is to just provide it as liquidity and then basically, yeah, wait a bit. Uh, but if it's going within one block, then it, it's going to happen. I'm, I'm pretty confident this is not going to change on the long run. Hmm. Agree. Yeah. Well, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully layer twos will uh, solve some of that. Uh, so let's get into layer twos. So this is one of my favorite topics. Um, I have a very simple question. Is optimism going to go to $100 per token? No, I'm just kidding, Derek. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna I'm not, I, I don't do token speculation. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but look, um, 
it's super exciting to talk about layer two. I think that uh, Starkware and the release of Stark that is so, something I know I've been waiting forever uh, for it to occur and to come into fruition. It finally is. Um, what are your thoughts there? What is your team, team working on? Um, and how do you divide between working on layer twos, working on security, um, and also on anything else that comes up from MKR token holders? Uh, or if the end game ever comes into, you know, into a vote and it gets passed, how do you divide all that work uh, when it comes to your team? Yeah, it's uh, the, the one thing here is the, the level of complexity in L2s really kind of goes exponential because it's, it's not just one chain, it's a sort of a sub chain. And then you may have uh, the cross communication with chains and then another level down, it's entirely possible that's a replicable uh, chain or layer two. So um, how do I split the work? Well, we have, we have a part of the team focuses specifically on layer two work. Uh, for example, at the moment we have Sam working on DSS bridge, which will move us beyond the L2 to L1 space into the L2 to L2 uh, space. So, um, you know, there's, you know, that will give us the, the full teleport capability and it really starts moving us beyond just looking at the bridge component into other areas of, of the protocol like the VAT, how we interact with the core maker protocol. So um, it's, it's, it's not something you can scale you know, super quickly because we need to do these iterative steps, then have team review, then bring more people in who have experience with the core maker protocol and then work to the, uh, work the, the following um, you know, components of the, the system into it so that we, we end up with being able to mint die on L2. So there's a lot of moving parts. Um, the, the discussion around like end game, all that sort of stuff hasn't impacted the work that we're focusing on here with L2. That's, you know, that's part of the mandate that's documented the roadmap. I shared that a couple of days ago around what that looks like uh, for the rest of the year and beyond. Uh, and there's also interaction with StarkNet and how does that work with them as a dependency on us for a lot of these items because they'll be taking a lot of what we work on. So it remains a top priority and it's something uh, that we'll continue to focus on with the team we have. And I'd like to scale it as well. Uh, for some of those scaling discussions, it really depends on uh, where the rest of the DAO wants to go as well. You know, some of these are uh, layer twos are evolving over time and they're going to grow. Uh, but at the meantime, the value or the, the, the volume isn't necessarily there but it's going to get there as these systems evolve. So we need to be ready for that. Um, yeah, so that's a, a short answer. Hopefully that kind of covers it. Well, yeah, for sure. I appreciate the thoughts there. And, you know, as someone who's been around Maker uh, for a while in the crypto markets, uh, well, you've been, you've been around longer than I have, but do you believe that this, these are just cycles where, you know, we have uh, a downdrift, for lack of a better word, and then... It gets really quiet, you start building, and then all of a sudden something just elevates this ecosystem to another level. Do you think that's what's happening here? And I guess if, it, if that is happening, which I think it is, uh, do you think layer twos are the ones that are going to be the benefit, the benefit beneficiaries of, of this down cycle? Because there's a lot of building going on. Um, and the second part of the question is NFTs, uh, I want to hear your thoughts on NFTs and how they can um, co-mingle with MakerDAO and somehow, some way, um, be productive in society. I mean, if you think that is possible. So, yeah, I want to hear your thoughts on those two things. I'm sorry I'm going from layer twos and the possibility of the market cycle to NFTs, but if you can take that question, that'd be super yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, layer twos, absolutely. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. We haven't really covered all the opportunities that exist around ZK Sync or Aztec, um, uh, you know, multi-sig wallets on these chains, what opportunities they could offer for people who want to have more privacy focused solutions. Um, I think that's a whole new space that's, that's going to come up from L2s. Uh, I think it's, it's like we wrote in our multi-chain strategy originally that you're going to have these towns and cities build around layer twos. Maybe you don't need the security. Maybe you just need fast transaction speed for uh, game skins, for example. Uh, maybe they become more expensive and they move into other cities or they're transferable elsewhere as certain tokens or NFTs 
I think all of this is still to be figured out. So on the L2 side, definitely I see a lot of work happening here. Um, the, the move from optimism to the, the foundation and their evolution into a DAO, I think is, is pretty cool and you know, says a lot that that space is going to grow. Um, on the NFT side, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm curious. I, I don't know. I guess you have some apes you want to put down as collateral, Frank, and uh, <laughs> we might have to wait a bit for that. <laughs> but but, but do, you, do, you think, do you think NFTs will eventually have some type of value or you think it's just uh, one of those moments, kind of like the Beanie Babies, if, you know, we can go back that far in history? Uh, is it a Beanie Baby moment or NFTs are here to stay? I think the underlying... Uh, technology is here to stay. I think it's going to morph and change into things we haven't even fathomed yet, uh, whether it's other real world contracts, documents, uh, things, data, whatever. I, I definitely think there's a use case here for all of that. And there's therefore also going to be a marketplace for all of that. Uh, how we price it and how we integrate it, I don't know yet. Uh, we're actually, the team is working on uh, documenting the current state of NFTs at the moment and how that could you know, work or could it in some way work with Maker. Uh, so kind of building upon Monet Supply's post a couple of months back where he dove into that from the risk perspective. So we're also considering, okay, what, what could that potentially look like from a, a, an Oracle perspective? How would you price it? Uh, what does the floor look like? And can that be in any way you know, guaranteed or used in, in some way, perhaps it's not really offering it as a vault, but perhaps there's another facilitation mechanism from a seller to a buyer or a lender and a borrower type of thing that could be facilitated here. So we'll have to see. Uh, I definitely think there's value there. Um, I personally was too slow to get on the NFT bus. I, I didn't see it upfront when it started, but now looking at these different tokens, like the soulbound tokens, I think there's a lot of opportunity there that hasn't been explored and it's a new implementation that could be valuable for you know anything driver's licenses house deeds you know you name it if you want it um non-fungible but are bound to an individual then yeah you know, there's there's a lot of opportunity there for sure yeah no i agree with you i think uh actually if it wasn't for nfts i wouldn't be able to have uh this music uh, the rights to play um our own music here for the show um, one thing I remember uh, speaking, because I, I, I admire how you coordinate um, protocol engineering's uh, affairs, right, for lack of a better word. But I, I love the way you organize things and how, you know, there might be a proposal out there that the team might not agree on, might have different feelings on. But you guys are still kind of focusing on that. And uh, MKR token uh, owners and recognized delegates and delegates alike should appreciate that. One thing I remember uh, talking to you about was coordinating between core unit teams and how we can communicate better. Uh, you know, I am an individual who goes to just about every conference if possible, and I meet so many individuals who want to work with makers out. And a lot of times, you know, it's either a business development deal or some kind of software engineering deal. Um, and, you know, it's hard for me to go and talk to someone on a business development team like the growth core unit and then come back to maybe you know risk or maybe protocol engineering and kind of mesh them together because we're so spread out right what are your thoughts on how to combine communication uh between core units to make it more efficient mm. yeah good question i think you've got to bring it back to specific projects so Again, let's just take the L2 in, as an example. We have a, a pretty basic rudimentary call every Tuesday where I walk through the L2 planning spreadsheet. And this is basically meant to be a breakdown of, okay, how do we get to the finish line of L2? We've got our spell on the 31st. We've got to draft uh, the, the mainnet spell, the girly spell. We've got to do oracles. We've got to think with growth. We've got to work with data insights. And these are all things that you know happen in a sequential manner. So that call in the in this specific case of l2 is i think the key sort of linchpin that pulls together all these different teams and really lets everyone know where are we and what does the sequence look like so that that i think is a very good mechanism for keeping things specific to one particular deployment or one product set um i don't see why you couldn't do anything different for 
uh, like we did earlier on with uh, institutional vaults, talking to partners, talking to growth, talking to the PE developers, getting it audited. These are all, it's all just stakeholder management. So as long as you can pull these people together in a call, not a chat, uh, my view is it has to be a call because that's you know interaction, engagement, people know who's responsible for what. Um, so yeah, that's uh, for me, the call setting that up is uh, kind of the main thing. You know, I'm smiling right now because I think has a very nice question for you to close this out. Tim, why don't you ask him yourself? <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe you have one more last thing to share. Like, I don't know, some, some, uh, some alpha leak that you are secretly hiding and that you are ready to release right now. <laughs> uh, Tim, you, you know, I'm fully transparent. Everything is out there, man. It's, uh, it's bullshit. However... I do have one thing that we've done this week. Uh, it's testnet, but it's still alpha. Um, we've had Bartek, who uh, you guys both know, is our, our hero on L2 work. He has been working with uh, the ZK Sync guys, and we have deployed testnet fast withdrawals this week. So uh, oh, you, you may that's have... pretty nice alpha. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. Keep that one under the hat. Um, so it's, you know, it, it, it's early days, it's test net. Uh, we still need to do full end-to-end -end tests. We still need to set up all the test suites. We still need to do reviews. But uh, ZK Sync said a couple of days ago that they're coming out in 60 days. So we want to be aligned, prepared, and ready for that. Uh, we still have a lot of work on our side. I'm sure they have a lot of work on their side because things are not complete, but we are tracking along and you know trying to make sure that we, we're in sync with them. And uh, yeah, so that's another little piece that we're, we're working on and slowly getting out oh, the door that, as well. It sounds really nice. Being, being in the first wave essentially is a, is a really, really nice treat. Cool. Yeah, exactly. So you'll, see, you'll remember this from uh, Arbitrum, right? We, we weren't the first out the door with USDC and we therefore suffered. So as long as we can keep safety the first priority, make sure that we have things audited, make sure that we have internal reviews, other teams review it. Uh, then, then yeah, we're all good to go. So, uh, yeah, that's nice. Thanks. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, it's super awesome. And so, in your opinion, you're saying that we should be, we should get the first mover advantage, advantage or in any layer two, if possible. Is that correct? Am I interpreting that correctly? That is correct. Pending security, as long as security is 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 sufficient, because I think a lot of people are underestimating the bridge risks here. Um, uh, Louis from StarkNet, uh, Core Unit, and Bartek are both working on a post at the moment. Uh, so maybe this is a little bit more alpha. Uh, you can expect it soon. It's a document that will break down all, uh, I think, about 10 or 12 different hacks over the last couple of months. And just to highlight the risks that are involved here. And because we're talking canonical die, we're, we're not only talking about the chain, we're talking about impacts debt ceilings, limits to, to make it L1. So we have to be really, really careful uh, when doing this work. And so, yeah, as, with that as my caveat, absolutely, we should, be, uh, we should be first mover on all of these chains to make sure that we're, we're in. All right. Well, listen, Derek, it's been a pleasure having you. Um, I really would have loved to ask you if teleport keeps you up at night, but I'm pretty sure it does, among other things. But uh, thanks for coming on the, the uh, Shoopy and L Pro Meet the Maker Special Edition featuring Derek Flossman. This has been great having you. And I hope you come back because there's so much we can talk about, right? But uh, yeah. Absolutely. Cool. Thank, Thank you, you guys. Much. Appreciate it. Cheers. Cheers, Derek. Thank you.